So this week we were supposed to start with the carrot series and I was super looking forward to it, but then I was double checking something yesterday before getting the video off and ready to go for you and I saw something that really irritated me on Brambleberry's website regarding carrot seed. And so I went down a whole rabbit hole. And so I decided that I need to hold off on that because I either need to add more information to the carrot series or I just need to get to a point where I'm no longer mad at Anne Marie because right now, I'm kind of mad at her. And so we're gonna move on to the acidics in a lye solution instead. And we are going to start out with red celery, which is totally a real thing. Just ask Mr. Soap and Clay. I will tell you more about the acidics in our lye solution and all of the things that we will be working with this week in just a minute. But before I do, hello, I am Mrs. Soap and Clay. Let's make stuff. How's it going, Sudzers? Welcome back to the channel. You are at Soap and Clay, where we make all the soapy things. And you are here for a week of weird stuff in soaps, and we are going to be doing a deep dive on said weird things. This is what we've been doing all of 2024, really diving into different ingredients that you can put into your soaps, either within the lye solution or within your oils, ways that you can infuse your oils yourselves. So like we did a coffee butter and coffee oil, way cheap way easier to do it at home than you know to buy it from brambleberry specifically and yeah for the summer months for may and june we're really focusing on fresh fruits and vegetables within soaps and so we are continuing on with that following up from the spinach and working on really acidic vegetables or fruits within our soaps and today we are starting with rhubarb now rhubarb is a really interesting uh, root, vegetable, fruit. I have no idea what it is. Now the reason I wanted to explore rhubarb is realistically for one reason. Uh, rhubarb is a very strange thing in my life. It doesn't really exist except for once a year, for one week, there would be like a patch of rhubarb that would grow next to the fence in my grandmother's yard aside, completely separated from her actual like vegetable garden and she would wait for that to happen and when it was time to get the rhubarb she'd make like one singular rhubarb pie out of it and i was always there on that day and it was a great experience and so that is why i wanted to do rhubarb because i love my grandma and this is usually the time of the year where that would have occurred so yes rhubarb very interesting in and of itself though when we're talking about topical benefits it's kind of an unknown in some circles because actually in chinese medicine and holistic medicine that rhubarb has been a thing for a long time for topical ailments, for wounds and burns and all of the jazz. But there's also a lot of really interesting conflicting information about does it help cure cancer when you're eating it or does it actually cause cancer or other really bad, not good things within your system. And one of the reasons for that is the oxalic acid, which exists within rhubarb in very, very high quantities. Now we talked a little bit about oxalic acid within the spinach series, and I wanted to go ahead and talk a little bit more about that within rhubarb, but more importantly, because rhubarb is so acidic, I think its pH is between three and four, I wanted to talk about what happens when we put an acidic liquid in place of our waters into our solution for our lye and effectively just consume a portion of the sodium hydroxide, therefore yielding a higher super fatted bar. I wanna talk about that. I wanna explore that. And so we will be preparing the rhubarb. We're going to be using the juice. I'm going to tell you why we're not using the solids. We will be making the soap. We'll be seeing what the color does within the soap. And if we can keep this gorgeous pink that was within you know, the actual juice. And we're also going to do some tests on the juice itself as well as on the final bar. So for all of this, we're all gonna get cradle to grave. I'm only doing one soap. And so we're gonna start from the very beginning with all of the infusions and everything. Talk about the benefits of rhubarb. We're gonna do the lather test today. We're also gonna do pH tests. And we're gonna talk more about 
acidic stuff in your lye solution and whether or not i don't know we just came up with a cool hack to reduce the ph level of your soap and if that even matters so let's get to the video and we can do all of those things you know there okay so we are juicing rhubarb today and uh, we are going to talk about rhubarb in soap what it's made of what we can expect to get from the soap itself and whether or not that matters like is this a good thing to be putting into your soaps and so what i am doing is first cutting off all of the end pieces much like you would do with celery because this is celery it's red celery it's not it's a perennial plant i don't know what it is though i really don't i have no idea if it's a fruit or a vegetable or a root or i don't a root vegetable i don't know listen i don't know uh vegetables or plants just kind of generally that's not my area of science but anyway we're going to be cutting everything up and putting it into the juicer to extract all of the goodness that comes from the juice and uh, leave behind all the waste which is going to be primarily fiber in this particular instance now Ruvar itself, what do we know about it? Uh, well, we know that it has uh, toxic leaves. We do know that. Uh, but the actual stalks themselves, super edible. And uh, in, like, Chinese medicine, it's been used a lot. A lot, actually. Like, a whole lot. to For all manner of things. Topically, for wound healing and inflammation. It does help with out, out with free radicals, is the claim. And... It's also a bit of a controversy when it comes to both topical and internal applications. But also, look at the juicing of that. Look how much juice we're getting from that. Isn't that amazing? That is so wild. And also, you see all the bubbles there? That's how you know there's saponins in the solution, which is like the way that you test for saponins. I don't know if you know that, but the easiest way to test for saponins is to take a, a sample of whatever solution you're doing and that's the carrot that's trying to come out there. I did break my 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 juicer with all of this because the roots, the actual roughage, all the fibers and everything, it, it did not come out. It bound up in there and I had to eventually fix it. But anyway, saponins. If you want to test for saponins, you just take a sample and you put some water in it. And then you just kind of shake it up or, you know, twirl it around a little bit. And if it bubbles, like there with the spinach and the remains of my... Yeah, my, the, the rhubarb, yeah, it broke. I had to fix it. But anyway, if it bubbles up, like you see there, that means saponins are present. Anyway, a pretty good amount of saponins. Absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous freaking color with all of this. And that's all coming from the edible bits of the rhubarb itself. Now, rhubarb, what is it basically comprised of? Well... First and foremost, it's very, very acidic. It's very, very tart. Uh, and what we have within it, lots of stuff, uh, primarily anthraquinones. Now, anthraquinones are going to be the reason why rhubarb gets its really pretty red-pink color that we're looking at here. Isn't it absolutely stunning? It's so gorgeous. I'm going to test the pH on this, show you the acidity level. It's very acidic. So we're going to see what this does within our lye solution because it's super acidic, because we've been talking about what happens when you use things like citric acid and whatnot within your lye solution because as we know if the solution is working to neutralize itself so the sodium hydroxide very alkaline working with the very acidic rhubarb are we going to just essentially neutralize the lye and then we therefore don't get soap you know what i mean the answer to that is no because while we do have all of this juice it's still like 80 percent water right and so we're only dealing with 20 percent of anything else that exists any other chemical compounds that exist within this juice but as you can see that solution got ugly ugly so fast now this tells me a couple things first up this tells me that flavonoids are definitely present because the way that you test for flavonoids is to uh, take a solution and you put just a little teeny tiny bit of a sodium hydroxide solution in it and if it gets really intensely yellow or green that means flavonoids exist, so that's fun. And so what that is doing is one is two things, uh, showing me that flavonoids exist within all this, but also showing me that indeed a neutralization effect is occurring, and so we are consuming a portion of the lye solution. Enough of a portion to matter? No. Uh, this is going to be an even weaker bind than with citric acid, and so... 
while it takes, I think, I, what is it, three? I don't, I don't remember with citric acid. Anyway, less lye is consumed with the rhubarb and the acidity that's in it with the oxalic acid than within the citric acid, which I did talk about in the spinach soaps. So you can go back and refresh if you need to for that. So it's not going to ultimately matter. It, it will be a slightly more super fatted bar, yes, but it's not enough to actually bother with a calculation and fixing that. But a portion of it did uh, get consumed of the lye. And so I really wanted to show you what happens or what it really looks like when you, you know, uh, so I put it into the glass and oh my gosh, terrible things could happen if we put glass in there. Just kidding. Just kidding. It was a joke. Yeah, no. It, it's, it's, I love people that are like, oh God, don't ever put lye into glass. There it is. It, it happens. It's about to get even weirder throughout all of this too, because I'm putting all kinds of things in glass. Anyway, so I am going to go ahead and test the alkalinity of the actual lye solution. And as you can see, that's quite alkaline. This is dark as you can get. So no, we're still good. We are not working with a solution that does not have enough uh, lye, sodium hydroxide within it in order to make soap. So we're all good. Our fatty acids are going to be broken down. We are going to create the alkali salts. We're going to make soap. It's really good. But that acidity will impact it in the form of it's slightly going to increase the super fat. Now, does that mean if you're working with high, with high acidic properties within your lye solution or within your soap generally, and, or a high super fat, does that mean that the pH will by nature be lower? That's what we're going to test. And we're going to talk more about all of that. So back to what this uh, contains, rhubarb again, anthroquinones, anthroquinones give the beautiful pink red color. Also, it's, uh, they're commonly used for laxatives. Uh, anthroquinones or have laxative properties. Um, I guess topically they've been used for wound healing as well and in tests with psoriasis. All this information is linked in the description, by the way. In addition, rhubarb contains lots of polyphenols. So polyphenols are going to be your flavonoids, your phenolic acids, which have antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties. Rhubarb also has a ton of vitamin C, this scent is delightful. The peach, grapefruit, and thyme, pick it up. You should get that. Anyway, uh, lots and lots of vitamin C, which explains, you know, some of the acidity, all of the jazz. It's, and uh, vitamin C is obviously going to be good for free radicals, as well as uh, immune function, collagen production, all of the jazz. And then in addition to that, as far as what is inside, we're dealing with uh, some minerals. So we're dealing with calcium and potassium, which we have talked about within the spinach soap series, as well as the sea moss soap series. I'm not concerned about the amounts of calcium and potassium within the actual rhubarb because, again, it's about 80% water. So we're dealing with 20% actual chemical components that would potentially do something to our soap. And there's not enough. There's not going to be enough in there to actually create a soap scum within the soap. So I'm not worried about that. I am worried about the darkness of this batter, though. Super makes me mad. So I am going to go ahead and put some mica into one side. Because I had an idea that I was going to do like a cute rhubarb stock type thing going on. And ultimately it's not going to work. I'm going to instead do a very strange pour that's going to... I don't know. You'll see it when we get there. It, it, it looked weird. It was a moment for sure. But additionally, when, with the all the chemical compounds, what else is rhubarb comprised of? Well, we saw the rest of it when we saw my broken juicer. It's a lot of fiber. So there's a lot of dietary fiber that exists within rhubarb. And so realistically, if you're juicing rhubarb to get benefits and stuff, I think you're like losing the best part of rhubarb, you know, because you need that fiber. Fiber is pretty important. And the stuff that I was just talking about with all the anthraquinones and the tannins and whatnot, actually, that's one of the reasons why rhubarb is super duper uh, controversial. And also while being controversial, still being used in clinical tests for, you know, like cancer studies and potential uh, dealing with like chronic renal failure or sepsis or pancreatitis or obviously constipation and stuff because it can be, uh, it has said to potentially be a cancer causer. So that's very interesting. I found this article where they've been doing a lot of clinical trials regarding rhubarb because it has such a popular 
well, it's very popular within Chinese holistic medicine, I guess. And so that's wild to me. Do you live in a place where rhubarb just like grows naturally? Like that's a thing that just exists. You know what I mean? Like it's abundant. Because as I was saying before, I just there was one rogue random patch of rhubarb that was obviously not a part of my grandmother's garden. Like not at all. It was not something that she planted. I have no idea where it came from, how it got there. But every every June, she would harvest it and make one rhubarb pie. And that was it. That's all. That's the only. That's all I know about it. And I saw it when I was at the farmer's market. And it was so beautiful and whatever. And I'm like, yeah, let's put it in soap. Let's make it weird. But because Chinese medicine has been using this for such a long time, not only internally, but externally for all of its topical skin benefits, they have been doing a lot of interesting clin clinical trials to see if it is a net if, it, if it's ultimately a net positive right because it can be linked to cancer but and also the biggest thing is going to be the oxalic acid that exists within rhubarb just like within spinach but in much higher amounts and the oxalic acid can lead to liver damage and uh, also the inability to absorb calcium which as we get older obviously your ability to absorb and maintain calcium that's a very important thing you know what i mean and so they have been doing a lot of studies within this kind of controversial, uh, well, food, really, and it's kind of juries out on it. And so I thought, why not put it in soap? Because none of those things really survive saponification, right? And we're not eating it, so we don't have to worry about calcium absorption, and we don't have to worry about any sort of toxicity that could exist within liver functioning, because again, we're not, it's not internal, and so will we get any of the benefits that will come from the ultimate from all of the other stuff so the tannins and the saponins and all uh, and the well anthraquinones i don't know that that's going to do anything but certainly the polyphenols vitamin c you know those could be good good things to put in the soap we should see a shinier bar of soap because tannins going back to the tea series we should see a firmer bar of soap and we should see potentially an increase in the lather but let's go check all of that out Okay, and onto the cut, and this guy was sea popped, was gelled, and this is 12 hours later, and already it's coming out of the mold absolutely beautifully. We did get some soda ash on top, and I did not notice in my pour any problems bringing the soap to trace. Also, with all of this, I have been working with overly hot oils with the exception, or lye solutions, with the exception of this one. I did let that set up overnight because I poured it at night, and then I came in the next day. So it was 66 degrees, as you saw when I uh, tested the lye solution for its pH. Now, this soap, super shiny, super beautiful. You can already tell 12 hours after pouring it, it already looks so firm and shiny. I mean, that's very much looking like a 100% coconut oil soap, you know? And so I love that. I love that that means we will potentially have a shorter cure time. We will potentially have a longer lasting bar. And we will potentially have a much, you know, bigger, brighter lather. Potentially. I don't know. I really don't. Uh, that that, uh, that saponins exist is fine, but it's not being included in a high enough amount for it to super matter, I don't believe. There's kind of a difference between putting in like a soap nut or soap nut powder into your lye solution or within your traced batter or your oils then here's this thing that's 80% water, this juice that's 80% water, 20% everything else. And part of that 20%, like 4% in total, happens to be saponins. It's kind of a difference. So I don't know that we're going to be getting a super big bubble out of it, but it should be a, a good bubble. It certainly will not make the lather, you know, sparse. And that, that, that pour was weird. I, I was just like doing the zebra stripe thing and then I decided, well, not why not just also put a hanger to it? It's been a minute since I've used a hanger. I probably used a hanger like last week. I don't know. I don't know what it is that I'm actually publishing and not publishing these days because I have a crap ton of things filmed, but then I hold off and I give it to the members only for members only content because I find it more interesting and I, I like them more. And so, I don't know. Um, It, it could have been. Anyway, the soap looks beautiful i'm i guess like the actual funk the, like the the form of it looks fine the design of it the artistry of it 
it looks like crap. But we're kind of not here for whether or not it's pretty. We're here for whether or not rhubarb is going to make a difference. Any of these things are going to make a difference within our finished products. Now, rhubarb extractions will make a difference, and I'm very, very excited to try them within face products, within skin products, because I really want to make a serum with the rhubarb that is going to be extracted. You, you can extract all the goodness from rhubarb a couple ways. And so I have a glycerite that has been steeping and doing its thing, as well as a, a distillation that I used, that I did of the rhubarb itself, that I will be using within a serum in the cosmetic section of all of this. So definitely be on the lookout for that. Otherwise, as far as extractions go, this is kind of it. Juicing is going to be the best thing because there's like no oil in rhubarb, none, you know? So you're not gonna be pulling anything out of there. As far as pulling out any anything else, like maybe the color, sure, you can pull out the color throughout an oil infusion, but it's not going to survive. As we can see, it went brown, it's not fun. And so you're not gonna get a good color from it anyway. I do find that kind of fascinating though, because I feel like I use rhubarb root to darken like the actual root powder to darken my reds naturally, right? I feel like we did that and it worked really well. And so I guess there is something to be said about taking the rest of the fibrous material, dehydrating it, drying it down, pulverizing it. And that could be a potent actual colorant, but using it, it's not gonna have any topical benefits in that. It's just going to be for color. And so would that be a benefit within soap? Probably not, no, I would say that it would not. But I am interested to see what this lather does because even if it is just label appeal, that's a fun label appeal to say you have rhubarb in it. Super controversial and stuff, right? So let's try the lather. This is what it looks like four weeks after uh, I, I poured it. It has, yep, it's kind of just brown now. You can barely see the reds in all of it. I'm like showing you that it's as it relates to a bar that we know in the CMOS bars that was very, very orange. You can really see nothing there, but it is super shiny. I love how shiny it is. Very, very shiny, very, very firm. And this has been, again, four weeks after I poured. It, it stopped losing water weight about eight days after I poured. And so having done tests on it from then on, uh, no differences. It was cured eight days, fight me. And uh, that lather is beautiful, a gorgeous payoff. The slip though is annoying. That was annoying how much it slipped in my hand. I don't like an overly slippery bar of soap. So with this, I would probably incorporate an exfoliant in this to give it a little bit more grippiness for use in the shower or at the sink to that. But with this, it actually would be a great idea to maybe make this as a shaver and include some good exfoliants because that lather is really beautiful and it does stand up on itself feels delightful in the hand feels so good it's like when i i was obsessed i know i keep talking about the tea soaps but i was obsessed with the tea soaps they were everything good in this world felt like that i wanted to just keep using it and so i did and so yeah that's the ultimate overall lather very very gorgeous i'm not mad at that at all but i do want to test this ph before we get going with all of this and get back to my face because we want to know is this going to have a, you know, a lighter or a, a lower pH really? Because we started out with an acidic solution esque, you know, the juice. Okay, final test. Like I said, the juice was acidic. And as we saw the ac actual lye solution, it was not. It was super alkaline. But I went ahead and I made a solution out of the inside of the bar, cut some stuff out of the inside of the bar used uh, 99 grams of hot water, of boiling water, very, very hot solution right now, and one gram of the soap that I dissolved into the water. And now I'm going to take it first up and see what it looks like on a pH strip. And it looks actually kind of light. It's around, I would say an eight. That's a solid eight on the pH scale. Yeah, maybe a nine. I'm gonna go with eight. It's, there you go. Now, so what that means is it's it's a soap, it's alkaline. It bubbled, we saw it do its thing. 
Is it a 10? No, it's not. So it's significantly less alkaline than other soaps because that range is usually between 8 and 10. You know what I mean? But let's go ahead and use the UI and see what this does and we can test the pH perhaps more precise. Now, the darker the blue, the darker blue it goes after putting in a few drops. It's usually like three to four drops of a UI into a five milliliter uh, solution or sample. And I always do four because I don't like odd numbers. But anyway, the darker the blue, the higher the alkalinity is. And that's a very light blue, as you can tell. So yes, it has a lower pH. What does that ultimately mean for our soap, though? Kind of nothing. It's still soap and it's meant to be alkaline. So uh, yeah, it, it's a thing, I guess. And there it is, a very interesting rhubarb soap. First up, I love the shininess of it, for sure. And so I am definitely just confirmed that the shininess is because of the tannins, because of the flavonoids, just like we saw within the teas, when we did the tea soaps. So if you want a very, very shiny soap, definitely consider including something like that that contains tannins or flavonoids. That would be awesome. Next up, the lather. Yeah, it's great. It's cool. I love it. I wasn't really expecting it to do much. There aren't a lot of sugars that exist within the rhubarb. It's a very, very tart tasting juice. And so I wasn't expecting it that to be a big lather boost, but also the lather was not diminished. And so that's a good thing. As far as the actual color, super bummer. Super, super bummer that it did not stay that gorgeous pink. And unfortunately, that just kind of is. It's such a sad thing to see whenever you're working with natural colorants and you have like a big, beautiful, thinking beetroot specifically, I think, or maybe it was the sweet potato. Either way, just a gorgeous purple or pink color within the actual batter. And then once it saponifies, it either goes white or it goes brown. In our case, as soon as we put the sodium hydroxide in, we saw that solution neutralizing itself, working with the acidity within the actual rhubarb juice. And yeah, it turned brown. So that's a bummer. As far as the pH tests go, hey, I don't know. It's definitely a lower pH than what many people report as far as their pH of their soaps go. Is a lower pH generally for my soaps? Not really. Not really. But I think there might be something to be said about does a super fatted soap mean a lower pH? But now that I think about it, I actually have the 34% super fat soap that I made as a mistake last year plus a 50% super fat soap that I made like two days ago. So between today and tomorrow, I'm going to test those pHs as well. And I'll show them to you in tomorrow's video. So we can see if maybe we're onto something with a higher super fat equals, you know, a lower pH. What that means in soap, kind of nothing. It kind of means nothing. Soap needs to be alkaline in order to do its job, in order to function appropriately. So you have your water loving end and your water hating end. And one side will bind to your water, one side will bind to your dirt, and then it separates. By nature, if you start messing with that pH and it stops being soap, it stops working. And so I don't know that it's a huge benefit to try to get your soap to neutral. And honestly, I have yet to see anybody who's been able to do that completely. So there's that. It's very interesting. The rhubarb is a fascinating one for sure. Lots of interesting information around it. I am going to be playing with this within the cosmetics a whole lot. So definitely be on the lookout for that. If you're interested in rhubarb as a topical benefit for your cosmetics, definitely subscribe, like, comment, do all the things that you're supposed to do on the YouTube things. That would be awesome. And for the sudsers who already do those things, hey, thank you. You're awesome. I appreciate you. I'm out of here. I've got a lot of things to do. I have some research on carrots. And I don't know, like I said, I guess I'm going to have to figure out whether or not I want to put brambleberry on blast. I don't know, I might feel that froggy. So, you know, definitely subscribe and stay tuned for that. But Sudsers, thank you for existing. Thank you for being you. You guys are awesome. Hope you're having an excellent day, week, time, everything, wherever you are. And I will see you guys all again tomorrow for more acidic soapy fun. Bye.